Welcome back to Spoonful of Sugar. Today's episode on esophageal disorders will be hosted by Kate Spencer, a third-year medical student at the Drexel University College of Medicine. Hope you enjoy. Hey, future doctors. Thanks for tuning in to Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Kate Spencer. I am a third-year medical student at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. So today we're going to review disorders of the esophagus, and don't get overwhelmed by these because I do feel like they're relatively straightforward. As long as you just review them, there's really nothing too, too complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a few questions along the way and allow you a few seconds to answer before I give the answers away to just kind of help you study. I always found that when I was in M1 and M2 and then studying for step one, but this was really the best way to study when I was on the go. Anytime I'd walk my dog or anytime I was in the car, I'd just put on a podcast and it was kind of like having somebody in the car or walking next to me quizzing me. And so I really found it very helpful. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about today is a tracheoesophageal fistula. And this is an abnormal connection between the trachea and the esophagus. The most common type is a proximal esophageal atresia with the distal end of the esophagus coming off of the trachea. And it might be hard to visualize. So if you're at your computer or if you're able to pull up your phone and, and grab a picture, it might be helpful to just visualize kind of the orientation of everything. It usually will present as polyhydramnios in utero because as you recall, in utero, the fetus swallows the amniotic fluid. And obviously we need a you know, fully connected esophagus in order to do that. So can anybody think of how this might present in a newborn? So if you said drooling, choking, and vomiting with the first feeding, you are correct. So that was a relatively straightforward one. So we're going to move on to the next one now, um, which are esophageal webs. So can anybody tell me what the heck esophageal webs are? So if you said bands of mucosa oriented across the esophagus, you are correct. And while I'm in a question asking mode, can you think of a syndrome that is associated with esophageal webs? So if you said plumber vincent syndrome, you are correct. So plumber vincent syndrome is a triad of iron deficiency, anemia, dysphagia, and esophageal webs also might be associated with a beefy red tongue due to glossitis from iron deficiency anemia. So the mnemonic that I used for this um, during step one was um, a plumber dies, which is a little bit morbid, but it helped me remember and we can do what we got to do, right? So obviously plumber for plumber Vincent and then D for dysphagia, I for iron deficiency anemia, and then E for esophageal webs. And so with this, Um, patients will often present with dysphagia for large chunks of food. So our next esophageal disorder that I wanted to talk about is a zanker diverticulum. And so as with a lot of diverticulum or diverticula, it's important to know if it's a true or it's a false diverticulum. So does anybody know whether zanker diverticulum is a true or false diverticulum. And so it is false. And I always had the hardest time memorizing these just because I think it was just sheer memorization and didn't really, there was nothing I could conceptualize with it. So as you're learning, I would kind of keep a list of true diverticula and false just to have it organized for when you're studying for step one. So while we're on the topic of true and false diverticulum, Um, Can anybody tell me what the difference is? So true ones are going to be outpatchings that include all layers of the wall, whereas a false diverticulum is only going to include the mucosa and submucosa. So like I said, this is a concept that's going to really come back up a lot throughout your step one study. And so... A zanker diverticulum is often caused by esophageal dysmotility, which causes herniation of the mucosal tissue through the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. 
And so does anybody know how this would present? So it's going to present with dysphagia, maybe a neck mass, foul breath, aspiration, and obstruction. And a little bit of a gross visual, but you're going to get the foul breath because food is going to get trapped in that little outpouching. And it's going to kind of fester there and then therefore get really smelly. It's not lovely enough. And so there's one population of patients that we're going to see this in. Does anybody know what this population is? It is in older males. So if you said that, congratulations. Um, Next, we're talking about Mallory Weiss syndrome. And so does anybody know what Mallory Weiss syndrome is? So Mallory Weiss is a partial thickness longitudinal laceration of the gastroesophageal junction. And first aid has a really great way to remember this. If you think of the two L's in the word Mallory, M-A-L-L-O-R-Y, and then think of the two L's as a longitudinal laceration, that will help you remember that. This actually, this mnemonic, actor, I guess it's not a mnemonic, but this little memory tip helps me actually during my step one exam. So that was pretty great. Um, and then now that we have that covered, does anybody know what causes Mallory Weiss syndrome? So it's often caused by a lot of pressure on the esophagus. Um, so severe vomiting and the patient populations that you're typically going to see with this syndrome are bulimics and alcoholics. So definitely look for that in a question stem. Um, and then lastly, how is Mallory Weiss syndrome going to present? So Mallory Weiss is going to present as painful hematasis, which I think is very easy to remember. Lacerations in your esophagus are going to be very painful. And then also, you know, it's going to be bloody because your esophagus is going to be bleeding. And so it's going to be important to distinguish this from esophageal varices, which we're going to get to in a second. But esophageal varices um, are going to present with painless hematasis. So next, we're going to talk about Borjavi syndrome. Um, Does anybody know what Borjavi syndrome is? So Borjavi syndrome is a distal esophageal rupture. And does anybody know what typically causes it? It's typically caused by violent retching. And so In contrast to Mallory Weiss syndrome, this is a full thickness because Mallory Weiss is a partial thickness tear. Uh, This is also far more dangerous and can be fatal since it's an esophageal rupture. So the way I remember this, um, thanks to my pathology professor for the first two years of school, Dr. Hanau, is, you know, she wanted to say Mallory Weiss sounds like a very, very classy, put together name, and then Borjavi, which just more forceful and a little more violent. So think of Borjavi as the more violent and the more fatal of these two esophageal, you know, tears slash rupture disorders. So hopefully you'll remember that. And then one last pearl about Borjavi syndrome is it can actually result um, in air in the mediastinum. So the next thing I want to talk about, I prefaced this just a few seconds ago, Um, are esophageal varices. And so esophageal varices are the most common cause of death in a specific patient population. Does anybody know what this patient population is? So this is going to be in patients with cirrhosis. And does anybody know what esophageal varices are? So they're dilated submucosal veins in the lower esophagus that occur when the portal vein gets backed up into the left gastric vein. And then the left gastric vein backs up into the esophageal vein, resulting in dilated submucosal veins in the lower esophagus. And so these initially can be asymptomatic, but there is a risk of rupture. And like I just said, as opposed to mallory Weiss syndrome, that causes painful hematemesis, esophageal varices present with painless hematemesis. And this 
she also was on my stuff exam. There was a lot of um, GI stuff in that exam for me. All right. So the next disorder that we're going to talk about has to do with dysmotility in the lower one third of the esophagus. Does anybody have any idea what that might be? So if you said achalasia, you are correct. So achalasia is disordered esophageal motility due to damaged ganglion cells in the myenteric plexus. And does anybody know which specific substance is lost in these ganglion cells? So if you said nitric oxide, you are correct. Remember that nitric oxide promotes relaxation, including the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And the loss of the ganglion cells can either be idiopathic or secondary to a known insult. And so there's a noteworthy bug that is known to cause achalasia. Can anybody think of what it would be? So that is trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease. Um, if you have not seen the sketchy video on this, it's very helpful and did help me remember this. So achalasia is going to present as many esophageal disorders do with dysphagia for solids and liquids, halitosis, which is bad breath, high lower esophageal sphincter pressure on manometry, and an increased risk for esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. And so I once heard a good way to remember which diseases present with dysphagia to liquids or and solids, or which ones just present with dysphagia to solids. So anything that is neural and not relaxing, think achalasia, esophageal spasm, you're going to have dysphagia to both liquids and solids because the esophagus is so tight that nothing can get through. Whereas if it's a more structural obstruction, such as esophageal webs, you're just going to have more dysphagia to solids. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then the last thing related to achalasia is with a barium swallow study, the very specific sign that is seen in these patients. Does anybody know what this sign is? And so it is called the bird beak sign. And if you don't know what that is, this is a good one to Google because I don't think you'll forget it if you really see what it looks like. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. And GERD is a biggie. So take a second and think of features that we might see in patients with GERD. So the important ones that you should be thinking, we're going to see heartburn, sometimes mimicking chest pain. We're going to see esophageal ulcerations and then eventually Barrett esophagus, tooth and enamel damage, as well as asthma and cough. And GERD is caused by reflux of acid from the stomach due to reduced lower esophageal sphincter tone. And can anybody think of some risk factors for GERD? So some common ones are obesity, a high-fat diet, caffeine, hiatal hernia, and tobacco. So next on that topic, we're going to talk about Barrett esophagus. So in Barrett esophagus, what happens is the chronic washing up of stomach acid into the esophagus is going to result in metaplasia of the lower esophageal mucosa from what to what. So I'll let you think about what kind of metaplasia the lower esophageal mucosa undergoes. So if you said stratified squamous to non-ciliated simple columnar with goblet cells, you are correct. And as you might expect, this is going to increase the risk of gastric adenocarcinoma and dysplasia. So some people are going to refer to the area on the esophagus that has undergone metaplasia as kind of like a red velvety tongue-like patch. Um, you know, if you it literally in the photos, it looks exactly like a tongue and it looks very red and velvety. So that might also be something you want to just pull up a quick picture if you can. But if not, I'm sure you probably can get a good visual of it in your head. And so the last thing that we're going to talk about before we do kind of a rapid fire of questions and a summary is esophageal carcinoma. So as with most other organs, 
we can get cancer in the esophagus. And unfortunately, these have very, very poor prognoses due to a very late presentation. There are two types of esophageal carcinoma. There's adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. So adenocarcinoma is going to result from pre-existing barred esophagus. And it's usually going to involve the lower one-third of the esophagus, which is where we see Barrett's. Um, and I hope this is easy to remember since the metaplasia we see kind of puts glands where there normally are one. So, you know, naturally any glandular tissue has a risk of um, adenocarcinoma. And then can anybody think of another pathology that involves only the lower one third of the esophagus? I'm trying to tie some things in here for you. So if you said achalasia, you are correct. So the next type of esophageal carcinoma is squamous cell carcinoma. And this is actually the most common type of esophageal cancer worldwide, whereas adenocarcinoma is the most common in the United States. So squamous cell carcinoma is going to arise in the upper and the middle parts of the esophagus. Does anybody know what the risk factors are for squamous cell carcinoma? So think of anything that's going to irritate the esophagus, such as alcohol, tobacco, really scalding hot tea, achalasia from food getting stuck and rotting and irritating, esophageal webs where food can get stuck and irritate, and then really any other form of esophageal irritation can result in squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. Alrighty, so that about sums up all the new information. But before I end, I want to do kind of a rapid fire burst of questions for a review. All right, are you guys ready? What would be the maternal presentation of someone pregnant with a fetus who had a tracheoesophageal fistula? So that is going to be polyhydramnios. All right, next, um, what are the three things associated with plumber Vincent syndrome? All right, so that's going to be dysphagia, iron deficiency, anemia, and esophageal webs. So remember the mnemonic that I was telling you about, the plumber dies. All right, now we have a Zanger diverticulum. Is this a true or a false diverticulum? All right, this is false. Um, remember that it's often seen in older males and esophageal dysmotility can cause increased pressure in the esophagus, causing part of it to herniate between the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. And next we're going to talk about Mallory Weiss syndrome. In which two populations might we see this? So we are probably going to see this in either alcoholics or bulimics. And so remember that these are longitudinal lacerations of the esophagus that present with painful bleeding. Remember that with Mallory Weiss, it's a partial thickness tear. And then now that we talk about Mallory Weiss, can you remember what the disease of the esophagus is that is a full thickness rupture? So if you said Borjavi syndrome, you're correct. So remember that Borjavi is by far more dangerous and can be fatal. So remember that we said that Mallory Weiss presents with painful hematemesis, but there was something else that presented with painless hematemesis. Do you remember what that was? So if you said esophageal varices, you are correct. Remember that this condition occurs in patients with cirrhosis, and it is the most common cause of death in those patients. Now, if I say bird beak sign, what comes to mind? So I hope it's achalasia. Remember that in achalasia, we lose the nitric oxide producing and relaxing neurons in the lower one third of the esophagus. So it clamps down super tightly. And so with the bird beak side, we're going to get a normal esophagus, a normal esophagus. And then right when we get to the lower one third, we're going to get a very, very tightly kind of clamped lower esophageal sphincter. So the last thing I wanted to talk about and the last rapid fire question I have was about GERD. And so GERD 
can lead to which type of metaplasia? And then what is the condition that GERD can lead to called? So it is called Baird esophagus, and it is stratified squamous epithelia to non-ciliated simple columnar with goblet cells. Remember that GERD is caused by reflux of acid from the stomach due to reduced lower esophageal sphincter tone. And that is all I have for y'all today. Thank you for listening. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe to our podcast. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, visit our website at spoonfulofsugar.org and post them under the link for this episode. Best of luck with your studying. And if you need any help, let us know. And don't forget to check out all the other podcasts that we've done. Thank you. Thank you.